the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for hanging out today. Coming up on today's episode are the topics of remote viewing, psychic experiments in Russia, crop circles, and the permittivity of Bigfoot. Well, summer is winding down for sure, and I hope you're doing well wherever you are and that the weather is okay. And since it's about fall, it's time for me to start thinking about getting ready for winter because it's going to be here before we know it, in New England at least. And apologies if my voice sounds a little rough this episode, it's because I'm just getting over a bout of bronchitis that I came down with last week, but I am feeling a lot better now. Also, I want to say A big thank you for sticking around for the format change of the show for the past few months. I've been having a blast being able to chat with and interview some really interesting authors and researchers and people in general. And I have a few more coming and some new ones in the works. But just know that this fall, I plan on having a lot more time available during the week, so I will be getting back to throwing in research-based episodes. So that's going to be back in the mix. Really excited about it. There's a lot of topics that I've been sitting on for a while now that I'll finally be able to have time to do the proper amount of research to bring to you all, and it's going to be great. And a quick reminder to make sure to follow me over on all of my social media accounts for updates, more content, giveaways, and a lot more. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Threads, and X. And please also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to and set your podcasting app to auto-download so you never miss a new episode. You can also subscribe to the Strangeology Podcast YouTube channel as well. And make sure to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications, as I also post episodes there, as well as other video content on my channel with more stuff in the works, since I'll be having time to actually make it. And I also want to give a warm welcome to the latest member of the Strangeology Patreon. Welcome, Ivan. Glad to have you aboard. If you want to help support the show and the work I do, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. There's multiple tiers, each with an increasing amount of membership benefits and perks, some of which include shout outs, ad free episodes, early access to episodes, as well as the members only bonus episode extension, which is sometimes a whole episode by itself called Strangeology Beyond. There's also merch discounts to my Etsy shop, exclusive merch, VIP Discord room access for updates and behind the scenes stuff, a t-shirt of the month club, and more. So if you love what I do, please consider checking it out and becoming a member. Your support means the world to me and helps to keep the lights on and keep this train going. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash strangeology. Hope to see you there. And one more thing, since it's coming up in just a few weeks, I'm going to have a vendor tent at the Sasquatch Calling Contest and Festival in Whitehall, New York on Saturday, September 30th. It's an all-day, all-ages event that goes from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in Skeensboro Park, right as you come into town. There's going to be all sorts of vendors there. It's going to be a great time. It's kind of like this massive Bigfoot-themed craft fair, essentially. Lots of people selling Bigfoot stuff. I'll have some Bigfoot stuff, but also other cryptid stuff for sale as well. There's going to be some speakers, and at the end of the day, there's a contest to see who can make the best Bigfoot or Sasquatch call on this little amphitheater that overlooks the 
river that passes through town. So it's going to be awesome. Definitely come out if you're in the area and come find my tent and say hello. All right, on to today's guest. For this episode, I had the chance to chat with Dr. Simeon Hine, and we got into some really interesting topics surrounding remote viewing, parapsychology, psychic experiments, and even cryptids and UFOs. It was all over the place, a huge download of information, and it was a really, really fun chat. So I think you'll enjoy it. Let's go. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Joining me today is Dr. Simeon Hine. Dr. Hine is a former university professor, author, and researcher of paranormal phenomenon. In the mid-1990s, he found himself diving into the unknown when he first learned about remote viewing and went through training to utilize this skill. And he continues to teach online and also teaches remote viewing classes in Boulder, Colorado. And beyond this, Dr. Hine also has spent time researching and examining new scientific findings about topics like space-time anomalies, orbs, UAPs, and ETs, crop circles, and Bigfoot. So thanks for being here today, Simeon. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me. I like like your posters back there. Oh, yeah. I have a lot of uh, artwork from some of my friends who who do cryptid artwork, uh, and they're very, very talented people. <laughs> I can so, see that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So we've got a lot of things to touch on sure. today, um, and we're just going to run through the gauntlet. But my first mm-hmm. question for you today is, is during your time when you were at university, you were a statistics and research methods professor. Yeah, going, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and and going from something like that that's so grounded in, in science, facts, and data, what kind of caused the transition for you to start looking into paranormal phenomenon and everything in between that that entails? Because it's such a huge, uh, all-encompassing topic, you know? <laughs> Right. I think partly what it was is when I was in high school, I was on the high school debate team and it, it ta- in New York State. And it, it taught me to be skeptical, uh, even skeptical of your own arguments. You're, you're kind of looking for the counter argument. That's how debate works. And so you're you're skeptical of even what you're teaching and what you're reading in the textbooks that you're having your undergrad students read. Right. And so I had come across another graduate student had introduced me to this idea of fractals and chaos theory, fractals being the shapes of nature, irregularly, irregular branching shapes, the way our bronchial structure looks or the spiral patterns in our heart or the inner ear. Those are self-similar patterns and fractals have applications. It's not just something that's interesting. It's used in JPEG compression, satellite communication, because you don't need to send all of the data. You can have an algorithm and just have some of the data points. So what fractals taught me is that not everything fits on the line. And so much of modern statistics and research methods based on statistics are based on this idea of getting linear approximations right? You want to fit things to a regression line to be able to get some degree of prediction and sense of how variables relate. But what if reality doesn't really look like a line? Then you're in the situation where you're imposing a mindset from whoever the statisticians were 100 years ago, Fisher and Pierce, and others who've come under criticism for other reasons. Maybe you're making reality fit into a box that it doesn't want to fit into. And that's how it all started for me. I began to wonder whether modern social science had a really deep flaw. It was just an idea at the back of my mind. So when I started coming across these topics post graduate school, post being a professor, Uh, at WSU in Pullman, Washington, I was open to the idea maybe there were other 
science topics that had been completely overlooked because they weren't based on linear approximations. They were based more on fractals and chaos theory, which was something that was becoming popular in the 80s and 90s, which is that small changes can create big effects, the butterfly effect, as it's called. So, so there were like, I thought there were some hidden problems within social science that needed to be addressed. So when I came across these topics, I thought, oh, this is what we've been missing is everything that doesn't fit on the line. Yeah, that's uh, very fascinating. And there, there's a, a theme that I keep running across whenever I look into things that there's, you know, a, a very strict rigidity to academia and how science looks at the world. And science is supposed to be testable and you, you should be able to ask questions. And a lot of the times people kind of get set in their ways as to how the world works. And obviously we need to be able to entertain the idea of, of new things to look at and be able to research right. and, and look into these different types of phenomena that we might not understand. <laughs> right. And there's a, there's a, there's a strong bias not to go into new topics because of the stigma associated with it. There is an unfortunate feature of modern professional science and academia. It seems since it became funded by big government uh, post-World War II, that it decreased the willingness to look at outliers and phenomena that don't easily fit in with existing paradigms. So what it causes to happen is a slowdown of science progress. You, you, you become hooked into the topics that are approved by larger bureaucracies and their funding mechanisms, which means you avoid all of the topics that we call paranormal. Um, not just paranormal, we can cite this happening within science in many topics that we now accept to be true, but it happens to what's called paranormal. And so it leads to discounting the witnesses, and the phenomena, because it just doesn't easily fit in, in the box and it's taking a risk on your part to look at it. And, and I think there's this tendency to want to conform. So we find we're in the situation where we are today, uh, just as an example, where we have the Congress saying, hey, what is going on with these UFOs for the past decades, maybe going back 80 years? Why don't we know about this? Right. What are their secret programs? It's like they feel they've been kept out of the loop for many decades and they have been and we can agree there is a problem there they have to pass laws if they don't know what reality is out of so so there's this real long lag time and then there's this great catch up to all of these topics and that's i think what we're going through right now yeah yeah and and we'll definitely be getting into a lot of that uh later in the episode for sure but one thing that uh i really really am interested in hearing about is about remote viewing. Um, can you explain for my listeners who may not be familiar with what this is and the government's program into utilizing this skill during the Cold War? Right. Very good question. So this idea of remote viewing obviously goes back a long ways. It's mentioned in many ancient texts, potentially, for example, in the Ayurvedic texts from India, it is this sort of non-local awareness, this ability to perceive information without using your physical senses. And for whatever reasons, the Soviet Union and Russian culture were more open to these ideas than the U.S. and the Soviet Union and China started programs, it seems, at least as early as the 60s, maybe before, uh, to start psychic warfare programs. In the Soviet Union, it was sponsored and paid for by the KGB. Uh, from what I've read, there were at least five separate KGB departments involved in creating remote viewers within the Soviet Union with the explicit task of being able to use them in a way that's uh, as a weapon against the United States. Right. And China had these programs, too. We now know from declassified research. You've probably seen the movie Third Eye Spies by Lance Mungia, which goes into this in great detail. Russell Targ and Lance Mungia. Uh, people should watch that if they want to know the history. Well, the U.S. finds out about this sometime in the late 60s, and we're in the middle of the Cold War, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, so forth. And they, the Defense Department 
cor- correctly feels, well, if they have it, we have to have it too. So they started a program, which I think officially begins in 1972, even though I've come across former special forces soldiers who served in Vietnam in the 60s, who told me that they were told how to do remote viewing in the 60s. So there were obviously other programs going on, which still we might not even know about. The whole thing, Jeffrey, was heavily classified. Yeah. Because, it, yeah. And so this is where it starts in the United States, not the the idea of non-local perception, uh, precognition or telepathy or any of those ideas are new. But to call it remote viewing, that was something that was coined by the remote viewer Ingo Swan, an artist from New York City who wrote to Hal Putoff and Russell Targ at SRI when they were advertising for psychics to work with after receiving a grant from the CIA to start researching this. And it actually originally came from NASA, by the way. It did come from a NASA grant, and then it was passed to different agencies. The CIA was paying for SRI, as far as I understand. And Ingo responded, and he sent Hal Putoff a a paper that documented his ability to mentally affect the temperatures of thermistors, an experiment I think that he had done at NYU with Gertrude Schmeidler. And, And so what it showed was that there was documentation that with your mental intention, you could affect something at a distance. It got the attention of the folks at SRI, and that's what started our program here. Wow. Yeah, that's a, there's a lot of stuff going on behind closed doors and uh, hearing that there was people, soldiers from Vietnam that were trained in, in doing something similar. That's uh, pretty yeah. wild to hear, like dating back even before, you know, the CIA or whatever agencies yeah, it, it, were looking into commanders- developing it. I I agree. It's before that whole official program, I have come across these people and they identified me just intuitively as someone that might, they wanted to start talking to me. They didn't even know who I was. And they would say, you know, are you an author? And this person told me that his commanding officer had told, taught them how to look for tunnels and things using your intuition. Uh, And I said, what sort of system was this? And he said they called it remote viewing or something very similar to what we call remote viewing. So people were learning this and teaching this way back. Yeah, Yeah, that's really, really cool. So what was it? um, What was the training like that you went through uh, to to learn about remote viewing? And I'm wondering. Divisions kind of appear clearly in your mind's eye or is it just like a little blip of a thought or how does it work? Oh, good, good questions. Remote viewing is something that's built into all of us. We we all have an experience of this when you get hunches about things and insights without knowing how you knew it. Uh, uh, You might have the feeling to do something or call somebody um, and you there was a reason to do it but you didn't rationally know why at the time and i think uh people all have experiences of this where they just get a hunch or a feeling about a person or a place or a situation which leads them to make a decision and they later realize it was the correct thing to do but it was purely on a gut feeling that is the same thing as remote viewing remote viewing is just a highly trained version of that where you can do it at will on arbitrary targets that is what the uh SRI folks and the DIA folks at Fort Meade were able to develop. The images and the feelings that you get from it are very faint. And that's why it's tricky. And calling it remote viewing, it's not quite what it is. Uh, That makes it sound like it's some sort of satellite passing overhead, getting perfect resolution pictures of things. It's that gut intuitive feeling, but it's about targets that have been selected for you to view by a monitor or a project manager, or even a friend who wants to just put you know, a picture of something from a magazine in a folder. You could do it that way. Anyone can practice this. The surprising thing is it's much more accurate than you would expect. And I can say as a former statistics teacher, you wouldn't have expected it to be that accurate uh, if it was just guessing where you would just get a certain percentage right just from random chance. But I learned this at the Farsight Institute. There was a man named Courtney Brown that had learned it from someone in the official RV program who had worked in the program at Fort Meade. And the program was declassified in 1995. If you go back and do a search online, YouTube or something, 
you'll find there was something called the Ted Koppel show. And Ted Koppel had an episode about this, a show when the program was declassified, he had Robert Gates come on. And Gates was one of the people that was an RV critic. Keep in mind, a lot of the military and intelligence bureaucracy within DC did not like this because it means people can see what you're doing. You can go around the normal bureaucratic order of things that are par for the course in intelligence and, and military organizations. It's the same thing that special forces soldiers sometimes come across is going around the rules and things. RV allows you to do that. I mean, good RVers can read words on folders and things. They can actually place their mind at the location and see what's there. So, uh, excuse me a second. There were a lot of people that didn't like it within the bureaucracy and Congress. So Gates was one of the critics, even though I'm told by a lot of the former remote viewers, having gone to the IRVA conferences, International Remote Viewing Association conferences, starting in 1999, before even IRVA existed, and training with some of these former military viewers, uh, people like uh, Lim Buchanan. Uh, we were told by them that the same alphabet soup federal agencies came back to them all the time for new sessions. If it wasn't working, uh, you wouldn't have had the constant demand for it. And someone was even given a very high medal of honor, Joe McMonagle, purely for uh, the highest peacetime honor you can give to a civilian. Uh, purely, it said on the award, I, I forget the exact uh, the exact medal, but it was the highest you can get in peacetime. And it said for 200 RV sessions yielding 100 and something pieces of useful essential elements, EEs of intelligence. So we know it worked because we have this evidence, but it was controversial. And on that Ted Koppel show in 95, former CIA director Robert Gates came on and said, oh, no, it never worked. And Ed May, to his credit, even though his boss is at SEIC, SAIC, who was running the program after SRI, SAIC told him, you can't go on the show because it was classified, even though it's not now, and we could get in trouble. And Ed May said, tack with that. I'm going on to defend RV as the project manager from 1985 to 1995. I know it works, and I'm not going to let someone get on there and create disinformation. So he went on the Ted Koppel show, was fired by his bosses at SAIC, but he said, no, we have evidence it worked. So it's something that is uh, difficult often to understand how it works. But I think if you look at all the statistical evidence, including the, the initial study by Jessica Utz, who at the time was head of the American Statistical Association, the highest ranking statistician in the world at the time, and she looked at the evidence as a, just a neutral observer and said, no, there's really results here that are not explainable by any obvious direct effect that we know about. So the data showed that it works. Explaining it is another issue. But to answer your question directly, it's very faint signals. RV training trains you to pay attention to those signals. Yeah. Wow, that's that's really uh, quite fascinating. Now you it, it really is. Now you teach remote viewing or RV to, to yeah. people, what can someone expect who's interested in, in, in going to, to learn about it? You have something called the Institute for Resonance. That's your, right. your class or school for it. That's our nonprofit. Yeah. Because um, let me say one more thing about RV. It's not a remote uh, effect. It's an, a resonant effect. It's more like being able to tune into radio signals that are around us all the time. Cell phone signals, thousands around us, but we don't perceive them, right? We're not tuned into that frequency. Right. I'm tuned into you right now. The viewers would be tuned into this podcast. It's like we're on that frequency, but we know the other frequencies exist and we know that other podcasts are out there right now. And that's the nature of resonance is you can tune like an instrument to a particular channel. In the old days, we actually had AM and FM radios with a dial. Yeah. And you would literally tune across the dial and there was a mechanism in there that was literally tuning to different electromagnetic frequencies and picking up your radio station that was your favorite. I, I grew up in the New York City area, so I think my favorite radio station at the time was WPLJ, which I don't even know. We had these radio stations and you would listen to them before this, before internet. Yeah. So uh, that is resonance. You knew the other stations existed, but you had your favorite DJs and they vibed with you. You like the songs they played, right? You like the concerts they mentioned. It's like a vibe thing. That's how RV works, but it's really subtle. And so we can train people to pay attention to those 
more uh, increasingly subtle uh, pieces of information that we get. Normally in daily life, we repress a lot of that. We push that a lot back. We know from the work and brain physiology that you and I delete more than 99.99% of everything that comes into our awareness every second, just from our physical senses. So it's a question of learning to pay attention to very subtle perceptions that are within our body and our awareness that normally we wouldn't be paying attention to. The, the rule in RV is to write everything down during the session. So it sort of goes in the opposite, Jeffrey, of what we learned in modern education, which is don't say anything that you can't rationally justify. Right. It's sort of a bias within modern mathematics and science is it has to be repeatable and you have to be able to justify your answer in front of the classroom. RV is the opposite. It says just write down whatever you get and see if you can sort out what is the signal and what's the noise. What's coming from your imagination? What is that true signal? Which I pointed out here is very faint often. It's a very quiet voice. Everyone perceives it a little differently because we're all wired differently. But the main thing that people can get out of it, I feel the biggest practical use is to get to know yourself better and learn to trust your intuitions about people and situations and so forth. People who have taken my classes and other RV classes, there are other people that teach this. They've told me this was very helpful in my business and personal life to get to trust that sense I have in my body about uh, life and the situations we get into, rather than just listening to the formal information and what something presents itself as, but what is it really underneath? Your gut and your sensing systems will know, and and, and RV training uh, teaches you to pay attention to that more often than you would. So I think that is the big benefit, is just paying attention more to your gut feelings and intuitions. Not to say that there aren't people that can get very good at this and some of them will work with the police and some of them can do different things involving, it does work into the future too, short-term predictions about things and so forth. But I think for the average person, the main use is to get to know yourself better. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, it's That makes a lot of sense because there's so much information on all of these different spectrums that we don't perceive normally just flying around us, flying through us. And if, if we can tune up our bodies to be able to perceive that, you know, there's a lot of benefit to that, I think for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, I wanted to go back to the Soviets really quick because in, uh, in, in the topics that, that you have some knowledge on, you have a connection to someone that informed you about a, a Soviet PK or a psychokinesis yeah. experiment that was successful, you know, speaking on parapsychology and all this, you know, extrasensory abilities. Absolutely. When, when did this happen and, and what were they able to, what were the Soviets able to prove? I'm really glad you brought this up because this topic is so large and this is one example of how real this is and how little we're told about it not unlike other topics that we're hearing about in the news right now, that there could be things that are true that you literally haven't been told about. And this was one of them. This happened to me at one of the IRVA conferences in Las Vegas. There was someone there who was a former secretary of defense, and he happened to be sitting next to me at the dinner banquet, which often you have at these conferences, right? Yes. And he said, Simeon, I've got a story I think you'll be interested in. And I have permission to share this story. So don't worry, it's not breaking any national security. But he hadn't, no one had ever heard this story before. He had never told this to anyone. He said he was in a room with 30 people in one of the intelligence agencies monitoring a Soviet PK experiment in real time, psychokinesis, the ability to move and affect objects physically with your mental intention, your chi field whatever you would like to believe it is. And he told me they were monitoring a Soviet PK experiment in 1976 in real time. I don't know how they were doing this because he didn't want to reveal the, the sources and the methods, uh, which makes sense. But he told me they were monitoring it. And they, I, this, the Soviet PK sender was a thousand miles away from Moscow. And they gave him the instruction to bend a spoon back in Moscow from a thousand miles. And I said, did the spoon bend? He says, yes, the spoon bent. 
What? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he said, now you're the 31st person in the world to hear about it because none of the other 30 people ever talked about it to anybody. So I asked him, and this is in my book, Dark Matter Monsters. I got his permission to put it in the book and I give him great credit for doing this because normally the military and intelligence community never share these things again and they go to their graves and we never hear. No, this was proof positive. PK is real. RV is real. I said, wouldn't this be a great news headline? Wouldn't this be great for kids to know that just like Star Trek inspired me to be interested in lots of topics as a kid watching Star Trek in the 60s when I'm five, do you think this would be kind of cool for kids and, uh, you know, inspire people to, he goes, no, uh, sources, it's sources and methods outweigh, protecting those outweigh public information and news. And this happened in 1976. We're talking 45 years ago or something like this. Yeah, 40, it's a long time ago. And I'm the only one that he ever told outside of that small group of intelligence officers. So this is proof that the U.S. government knows about the reality of so-called paranormal phenomena. What else do they know about that have not has not been shared with the American public? But that's the PK story is that, yeah, they knew the Soviet. Now, when I told, I said, did you tell the remote viewing program? They had security clearances, high security clearances. They had a building at Fort Meade, not too far from DC. Uh, and they could have told, hey, you guys, there's a uh, very good PK person in, because they were kind of adversaries, the Soviet remote viewing program versus the American. They became friends later after the Cold War ended, as Ed May wrote about in ESP War his book ESP Wars East and West, which is very interesting how they went over and met their counterparts. But at the time, it was like a psychic Cold War. And I think the remote viewers would have wanted to know that there were PK experts that could do that. And he said, no, we never told them. When I asked some of the remote viewers who had been in the DIA program, they said, well, we never heard about that particular incident, but we knew about things like that. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, don't you? I mean, it it is incredibly fascinating, especially considering all of the the things that go on that we're just never informed about. You know, there's a, a need to know. And then <laughs> the only way we find out about it is through whistleblowers and, and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, we can find as we had recently happened with David Grush, the former intelligence officer, high level gave briefings to the president every morning, had access to 200, 2,000 special access programs. And he's telling us there's a huge amount of information that's not being shared with the Congress well, until recently. I mean, that we've got a serious situation here. Uh, no matter what you believe about UFOs or extraterrestrials, or even what we're talking about here, remote viewing and PK, you've got a very high level person coming forward saying, Houston, we have a problem. I was access to information that there's a crash retrieval programs within the U.S. government or within private aerospace companies that suggest that there's other types of life here, whether it's extraterrestrial or interdimensional or whether they come wherever they come from. It's here. And this isn't some no one has tried to discredit David Grush. He is who he says he is. And he held a lot of top security clearances. Uh, he even flew the X-37 remote piloted plane, X-37B or something. Right. Uh, he's done a lot of things. He worked for the NRO and another uh, National Reconnaissance Office and the National Geospatial Agency. These are two high-level government agencies, highly secret, that work with satellite images and so forth. Top-level security there. And he's saying we have proof positive that it exists. He hasn't shared it yet because it's classified. He's not going to break his security oath. But he he gave this testimony to the inspector general for the intelligence community. And they're serious fines if you just make this stuff up. So we're really facing, uh, facing a very, very interesting and serious situation here. And this is why Congress has got involved. Even Chuck Schumer, uh, you know, your neighboring state in New York, just came forward recently and said that he wants congressional hearings and he introduced a bill with language that the government should know about anything to do with this topic. And that it, I think this bipartisan legislation says that anyone who has access to this type of information about uh, non-terrestrial technologies has to turn it over 
to the U.S. government within 180 days. Not information, but yeah. 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 It's, uh, I follow it along with the story as much as, <laughs> as much as I can with my busy schedule, but it's, it's definitely kind of, it seems like a, a big crossroads with, uh, the world of UFOs and aliens. And, and people have been saying for years that there's, uh, governments or agencies, clandestine organizations that go out and retrieve crashed, um, trans medium, if you want to call them that, uh, craft that are in our oceans, they're in our skies, they're orbiting the planet, they're elsewhere in the solar system, and who knows exactly where they come from. It's, you know, it's uh, right. so, so, some a, a very big revelation, I think, that has some... And I just want to say one thing about Ooh. that, Jeffrey, is yeah. there were people back at the remote viewing classes at the Farsight Institute back in 1996 when I was a teacher there. There were people that had worked with NASA. There were uh, shuttle astronauts, civilian astronauts, those who had trained who perhaps hadn't been on the, the shuttle itself, but had trained to be a shuttle pilot and get all the astronaut training. And there was a fellow that had worked with NASA on transferring 16 millimeter film of the Apollo missions and all of that footage to video. And both of these people, um, believe me, this was quite a surprise. We're quite confident that these programs existed, that there was a big secret within NASA, that they knew about this and they weren't sharing it with us. And so that is one of the ways that I got interested in these topics later on is that I encountered witnesses at RV classes who were just there for to learn RV, but they had a story to tell. I'd like we're hearing from Dave Brush and I'm sure thousands of other witnesses Again, speaking as a sociologist of those who've been privy to this information, they signed NDAs, they're following the law and not disclosing, but at the same time, is it legal to compel them not to talk about something that Congress says they want to know about and they're almost ordering these people to talk? So it's coming down to a very interesting situation within the next year or so or, or, or sooner. Yeah, it's definitely going to be very interesting to see how this all develops and, and plays out. It's not something I ever thought that would happen within our lifetimes, but it's you know, here we are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. And this happens every this happens every couple hundred years ago to society. If you look about the history of science, that's something I studied at undergrad, uh, undergraduate school at, at Hampshire College, by the way, not too far from Vermont in huh. the Amherst. Yeah. yeah. In the Berkshires there. Yeah. And I, I've been studying the history of science ever since. It was long before getting involved in these topics. And you look at it and there are these really big changes every once in a while. Uh, Copernicus and Galileo. That, that was a huge change for the mentality of people who at the time thought there was nothing going on beyond the moon, because that's what Aristotle had said, that the super lunar area, lunar area, there's no change. It's just these fixed crystals moving around this you know the planets are on these crystals and it never changes you don't need to look there from that and the earth being the center of everything in the universe to realizing we're just one of many planets it, you know there was nothing beyond the solar system known at that time but that was a huge change and there was a huge resistance and people were you know killed over this Giordano nice. Bruno and others um, uh, Copernicus did not want to publish his book uh, on the orbs uh, until his he was about to die. He was afraid of the repercussions. It was published, I believe, after his death. Galileo is brave, and he says, no, Copernicus said that we're not the center and of the universe, and I can see these moons moving around Jupiter with my telescope for anyone who's willing to look through it. Not everyone was willing to look through it. They said we... Our eyes already from God already show us everything we need to see. You looked through the telescope and you saw these moons going around Jupiter. And he said, well, maybe that's our relationship to the sun and all the other planets. And then he's put under house arrest for the rest of his life by the Vatican for what? The crime of adhering to Copernican ideas. It was a thought crime. So we should not take for granted the freedoms we have now to even have this conversation uh, we are living in amazing time of openness seriously we none of us have to be afraid of talking about these topics 
the way we're talking about them. I don't have a piece of anything. You don't have a piece. We're fine to talk about this openly. And we should be very appreciative of that because people in the past paid a heavy price for questioning the dogma and the orthodoxy as they should have. And I feel we're doing the same thing now, but dogma, ironically, uh, comes from the scientific establishment and the science funding bureaucracies, which is something that Vannevar Bush, one of the Bush family members, Vannevar Bush, someone part of the early military intelligence community back in the uh, 40s, he warned about this in a paper that science could become too centralized. He's thought to have been part of the MJ-12 committee. Ah. I don't know if that's true. He's been always considered to be maybe one of the bad guys. But if you look at what he published, he said, I'm concerned that science is becoming too centralized, too government funded, and it'll take away from individual initiative, which will discourage people from sharing new ideas. Perhaps he knew about the UFO situation back then. This goes back before that time period. And he knew this was going to come out at some point and he saw where it was going. That's just speculation on my part. But if you look at his essays on science, there was a lot of concern it would become censored by modernized centralized funding apparatus. And Again, that is a pretty strong motivation for people in academia and other science institutions not to want to chime in or talk up, even though if they know something. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there that know something because I've talked to these people and they haven't come forward yet. And they have proof of exactly what David Grush is telling us. This isn't news to me from David Grush. I've been hearing about this from 20 years. Every so often, I run across someone who said they were asked to reverse engineer uh, UFO material. Uh, one of them was a guy named Phil that I wrote about in my book, Black Swan Ghosts. And he was fine with me using his first name. And that story was he worked for an aerospace company where they came to them, as I've heard so many times now, with a piece of something. It could be big. It could be large, not just a tiny little piece. And the, the, they will say, the people who created this went away. Can you help us figure out how it worked? And the entire group will look at it and say, this is not from Earth. This is way too advanced. We have no idea how this works. It's made up of materials which have isotopic ratios, which you don't find on Earth or in this part of the galaxy, the nanotechnology is too small. And now I've heard this from several people, even just uh, within the last year. And all of these people have signed NDAs and they're afraid of uh, civil repercussions against them from the federal government if they were to come forward. So we're just going to have to deal with this. There are people out there who've handled this material. They believe it to be extraterrestrial uh, for a variety of reasons. And these are people that are tops in their field. They're engineers and scientists. Uh, and, and I am told every 10 years or so, the, the U.S. government goes into the basement and takes out pieces of this stuff. Maybe it's from Roswell. I'm just suggesting that. And they go and they, think, they hope that maybe there's been a scientific breakthrough. And maybe someone will understand. And I've talked to at least three of these people now. Only one has come forward. The other two um uh, they want me to forget the conversation, but I can't because they told me exactly what it looked like, what it looked like under the electron microscope and how it may have worked. What they suggested is it worked directly with the quantum field. It was technology that could directly couple to the quantum field and change the density of quant the quantum vacuum such that it would just create this sort of natural propul propulsion by wow. making the space in front of it less dense in the space behind it more dense people like dr hal put have called it space-time metric engineering uh, he's talked about it too i don't know if he's seen pieces but he's talked about it at the irva ssc meetings society for scientific exploration he told us about it in in las vegas in 2018 about how he had been involved in these ufo programs within the U.S. government ever since Project Blue Book. I think that's what he was suggesting. It's a little hard to read what they're saying between the lines. It never Project Blue Book was not the end of the UFO research. It's been going on ever since. He said he was part of OSAP, which later became known as ATIP or whatever that story is. You've heard about this. And he said he told the whole audience 
that how it could work of change materials that could change the structure of space time, what's called permittivity, the electrical constant of space time, and literally change the speed of light for those particular objects, which is why some of them look bluish and they look weird and blurry. By the way, he explained you can he explained why paranormal objects look blurry. Their permittivity is oscillating. So instead of being fixed like the objects around us, which gives them a focused appearance, if their speed of light is oscillating because their permittivity, the ability to resist a external electric field, if that's varying, if that's how the technology works of these craft, they would inherently appear blurry. And this is the answer to so many skeptics. How come there aren't really good photos? This is even true of cryptids and Bigfoot. Look at all these photos of cryptids and Bigfoot that you find. And they to his credit, Tom DeLong, the rock star UFO uh, investigator, <laughs> yes, <laughs> who started the To the Stars Academy, had a tweet about a year or two ago. I put it in my book, uh, Dark Matter Monsters, because I thought he was right on after looking at this. Somehow he figured this out. He said maybe Bigfoot looks blurry because Bigfoot is blurry. Yes. And so do all of these objects and other things that we uh, So it's not their fault that your camera isn't designed to take things with oscillating permittivity. Anyway, Hal told us about this and that's how UFOs could work. And you got the feeling he knew about this from research. He showed us the bismuth magnesium materials, which are allegedly Jeffrey from uh, Roswell. Right. But he hinted that there were other materials, though he I don't think he was allowed to talk about them. So I think we're getting a picture now. If this is a shock to people to hear that there is research into UFOs and these phenomena and probably into cryptids as well, since it seems to be related phenomena, cryptids often show up around UFOs. Just read Stan Gordon's books, the, the investigator from Pennsylvania, Silent Invasions, an excellent example of that you get cryptid showing up where they're UFOs. You may not want them to show up where the UFOs do. It's tough. Yeah. They go together. They're resonant peas in a pod. It's a big mystery. And they're also blurry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so, <laughs> I was actually wondering. I'm not about trying to that. shock yeah. people, but this is, this is what's going on. This is the reality we live in. It's time to stop being afraid of it. Let's find out the science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and and I know there's, you know, schools of thought with, uh, you know, cryptids like Bigfoot, where there, there are people that believe it's a, a flesh and blood relic hominid that's remained elusive. But then there's also all of these accounts of, of people witnessing uh, Bigfoot and, in tandem with a UFO or orb sighting. And it's just really kind of interesting. It's it's uh, a bigger a bigger puzzle than than I think yes. we're, we're led to believe. That's exciting. When we find a bigger puzzle like this, um, that's exciting. You, you're seeing that there's connections between phenomena. That is the beginning of a big scientific revolution is when you start to see these are not isolated phenomena, like keep your big foot out of my UFOs and so forth. Uh, when you start finding out that they go together, they're often seen at the same time and you get the same effects on watches and cameras and batteries going on the fritz. Yes. The car won't start when the Bigfoot's <laughs> standing right there. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard this a number of times. Uh, or the car stalls right next to one of these cryptids. Th then, you know, you're dealing with something that has electromagnetic effects. And now we're on to a type of information that we can study a little more closely that we could measure and that tells us something about it. Now, the idea that Bigfoot's a relic primate um, and that it's just flesh and blood, I mean, even ordinary objects have frequency. It's not like there's a division between quantum woo and physical reality. Everything that's physical ever since Einstein created the equation E equals MC squared, it tells us that energy equals matter times C squared. Matter is energy. So it's not like things that appear physical can't have a quantum aspect to them that gives them variable permittivity, like I've argued, and you can see that in some of my videos on YouTube. Uh, it's not that you have to choose between flesh and blood and quantum aspects of a phenomena. It's both. It's if you think of the idea of resonance, I think you can see it brings it together. I mean, musical instruments are physical, but they also are energetic. They create sound. 
you don't have to choose between, well, it's something that creates vibrations and frequency and has an energy component. And it's also physical, it's both. And so are we, and so are the cryptids. And these UFOs, apparently, it's just that matter can take other forms. It can shift into other states where it's more self-organized, going back to chaos theory and so It has a self-organized state, what we call coherent matter. And then when you're in a coherent matter state, many things are possible. Uh, coherent matter is something that precedes even remote viewing. We know that the Soviets were studying this. Uh, Americans were studying this. Winston Bostick, plasmoid research for Department of Energy in the 50s, even going back to Nikola Tesla. Researchers even before Tesla were looking at these states of matter. They appear to glow. Orbs. These are related phenomena, and I would suggest this is why you see orbs around UFOs frequently, and you also see orbs around cryptids and other types of sites that, where there seems to be this type of activity. Very, very, very fascinating. Uh, are you familiar with accounts of Bigfoot being cloaked or invisible humanoids that people uh, witness in the woods, kind of like you know, like predator, the predator movies. Um, yeah. yeah. Would that be, you know, if, if these cryptids are potentially, uh, shifting their, their resonance, would that be, uh, you know, an explanation for what people are seeing or is this some kind of technology if they're, you know, not from earth? It's nature's technology. Ah, uh, we know from the research into coherent matter, ever since people like uh, Winston Bostick in the 50s and a host of uh, Soviet researchers, uh, Alexander Parkhamov and others, and many, many other Soviet researchers, that these types of matter, when they go into this quantum coherent state, there's a dark mode. There's a cloaked mode of these orbs. And this is something that I talked about a lot in Dark Matter Monsters is it's something that nature already does. There's types of ball lightning that are literally invisible. They could be around you and you wouldn't see them. Uh, American researcher Ken Shoulders, colleague of Hal Putoff's, working on this subject matter, concluded that there are these dark stealth modes. Uh, Taki Akimatsumoto, the Japanese researcher, also talked about these dark states of micro ball lightning, which he felt was responsible for what we call cold fusion low energy nuclear reaction, Fleischmann and Pons. Even Fleischmann and Pons mentioned some of this. Uh, uh, Fleisch, Martin Fleischmann mentioned this in an interview with Martin Tinsley. Uh, there are other facets of these phenomena which are less explored, but we know about. Now, if some biological entities like Bigfoot or other cryptids uh, are using this, it wouldn't be totally surprising that nature has already figured out how to incorporate this into biology. We know about organisms like cuttlefish and octopus that are very good at changing their color and becoming invisible to, you know, becoming like their background that you can't see them. I mean, nature already does this. So it wouldn't be completely out of line to think that there's other types of creatures, even if we would not want to think about this, that have mastered the art of invisibility. And that's why they have this saran wrap like effect when people see them, which has been reported many times. Now, there is a new movie coming out about this called A Flash of Beauty, uh, The Paranormal Bigfoot. It comes out in October. I got to see a screening at the Forks Bigfoot Festival uh, two months ago, uh, and I am in it. I have just a fair disclosure. I'm in it for a bit. They wanted to ask me about some of these ideas. They had an earlier movie called A Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, which I, I think is a very good movie. And I'm not associated with it, but I'm just saying... As Bigfoot movies go, this is very well done and very nice to look at and has great witness testimony. In the new movie, The Paranormal Bigfoot, this is exactly what they get into. Um, because I've seen the screening. I'm not supposed to share specifically what I saw. We don't want to have any spoilers. But um, And I did an interview with the producers of this movie for, on my YouTube channel, uh, Mike, Jill, and Brett, just a, a, a few weeks ago. People can look at that. But they wanted to cover this topic, Jeffrey, and they have witnesses who've seen this not just one, sometimes they have two witnesses who are going to report to you what they saw around this. And if you listen to various podcasts on the web, I'm sure you've heard them. You hear many people, including law enforcement officers who are often up late at night um, and times of the night where these things can manifest, where they've seen them literally Bigfoot and other types of cryptids go from a, apparently a solid phase 
into an invisible face in front of their eyes. Now, that is that cloaking. That is something we know about. I'm just suggesting we know about this from research into microball lightning, plasmoids, uh, coherent matter, and so forth. This entire area that has been studied mostly in a classified form since the 1950s. But this is what the discoveries is there, that matter can go into this transparent state where it just doesn't ref- the light goes through it. That's why. So I, I, it seems the cryptids know how to do this unless someone has a better explanation. I'm, my ears are open. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild stuff. Wild stuff. Uh, I'm curious about space time anomalies being associated uh, with Bigfoot and other uh, cryptids and uh, that kind of stuff as well. Uh, is this related to things like missing time, people getting lost in the woods for X amount of hours or days and they come out? And then the, people are like, you've been gone forever. And I, they're like, I only was gone for 15 minutes. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. In Dark Matter Monsters, I have a story of a friend that was in a crop circle that had this experience uh, where he went out to get film from the camera. This is in Avebury, Wiltshire, UK. It, this is just this is an example of that. He feels like he was gone for maybe 45 minutes by the time he gets back he encountered things on the way that seemed like they might have been from the past people speaking ancient dialects of english and dressed differently he wasn't sure what was going he gets back and they said you've only been gone five minutes these are space-time slips i've had friends who've encountered them going into restaurants that they try to go back the next day they don't exist or they've been chained up for years and closed and people experience this around bigfoot so this sort of space-time fluidity that sort of goes against our ordinary experience of this linear sense of time. It seems more like something you'd experience in a dream at night. Space time can have that fluidity when you're dreaming, but people experience this during the day. And as you point out correctly, Jeffrey, Bigfoot witnesses experience this too, where they uh, they sense the creature around, they see it or they feel it, and all of a sudden a couple hours have gone by and they're in the exact same position that they were when they sort of lost consciousness. They haven't been asleep. They know they haven't been asleep because their arms are in the same position. They're, they're literally in the same, they don't ache either. It's not like they've been holding, they were just doing, all of a sudden they, it's three or four hours go by. Maybe it was 1 a.m. All of a sudden it's 5 a.m. And right. you just come to, now one possibility again is these changes in permittivity that we talked about. If you get changes in the speed of light, you're going to have changes in time. It's part of something called the Lorentz contraction, and uh, which is something that Einstein focused on. A variable speed of light would create these sort of um, somewhat uncomfortable space-time slips where you can't account for a few hours. I've had friends who've experienced this in the woods. I don't know if it was from Bigfoot, but they were in areas where Bigfoot has been seen. All we know is they went in, and then all of a sudden they're back in the parking lot and hours have gone by. They don't remember how they got back there. A couple people together, not just one person. All of a sudden, they're in, it's dark. They have no memory of what happened. Um, other Bigfoot witnesses report, I've heard witnesses say this, that they were about to take a picture of the creature, and all of a sudden, they're back in their truck. Whoa. <laughs> now, their truck was a 10-minute walk over there. They come to, and the, they're in their truck, and it's running, Yeah. and there's no picture. So, what is going on there? And and this is one big reason why people don't talk about this more often and why it's often difficult to talk about with your friends and family. We're, I think we all have this instinctive fear of seeming strange or weird to people around us. We're mammals. We like to be part of a group. And we tend to shy away from things that will lead us to be ostracized. It's just an unconscious uh, instinct I think we have as animals. Yeah, And I think we do it with these topics because it's hard to talk about. As my friend in uh, in the Rocky Mountain National Park, the same one that had the missing time, she was walking with another friend and a huge 10-pound uh, rock flew between them horizontally. We know that Bigfoot are really good at throwing rocks and very accurate. Didn't hit either of them, but the friend fell down. It was right in front of her face. They're walking this far apart on a trail and the rock goes right between them. Wow. As my friend said, uh, Lauren, who do you tell this to? <laughs> what happened and ha- who do you report it to? Even when people do report it, uh, people who report UFOs have been told. What are they told? 
Uh, you saw a weather balloon. You saw flocks of geese or misidentifications of Venus. This is what Project Blue Book, the people that worked there, and I know one of them who manned the phones. This is what they were told to tell people is, you know, try to tell people with some conventional explanation. Well, people that see Bigfoot, what are they always told if they go to the park service or the park ranger or the police? Or, even if it's an encounter that was very uncomfortable and they feel like it should be reported because maybe they felt they were chased out of an area or something was taken from them or they just didn't like the behavior of the Bigfoot, which happens sometimes. There are certainly friendly encounters and there are also hostile encounters. It, it is a wide range of encounters. But they're always told you saw a bear. Right. And if it was Dogman or whatever we call these dog-like two-legged creatures, which yeah. could be a type of big, Stan Gordon argues, I don't know exactly what they are. Uh, you saw a pack of wild dogs and you're having a trauma experience. So you imagine, but no, these witnesses tell us it was on two legs and it was fast and it was tall and big and uh, somewhat menacing. And they're not describing typical dogs on four legs. So right. This is the challenge we face is can we get beyond creating these kind of bogus explanations and just listen to what the witnesses are telling us? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many people out there that see stuff and, and to help them have their voices be heard, I think is really important and to not uh, marginalize or make them feel like they're crazy, <laughs> you know, um, going back to crop circles, I, I wanted to touch on that for a little bit. Can you talk about some of the other um, electromagnetic effects that crop circles um, have on people? Because there are some some pretty interesting reports, you know, beyond missing time. There are a lot of reports around crop circles of um, strange things happening to people and to cameras and batteries. I have experienced this myself many times with our tour groups. I mean, I initially went there on a crop circle tour and then I started giving the crop circle tours from the person who had been doing these, who just turned it over to me in 2006 to do these tours. And we would see this almost every year that we went over there, at least once or twice a summer where we'd go in and every people's cameras would stop working. Brand new batteries. You know, you just went on a trip, you put brand new battery, you're all excited. You're taking out your camera. It doesn't work. Batteries go dead. Uh, there can be electrical damage as if there is a huge electrical discharge uh, so that it needs to be sent back to the factory to be resoldered on the inside. And that would be a pretty big discharge to melt solder. Uh, yeah. And these space time effects that it has on people. People sometimes get precognitive effects where they have a sense of what other circles might show up in the coming days and weeks. And it's accurate. And they draw good drawings of these. And um, effects like that, sometimes uh, metallic taste on your tongue. There's things that are indicative of an odd electromagnetic effect, which, again, I connect back to the shape of the circle, its ability to act like a waveguide to organize energy, even the ability to organize dark matter, perhaps, other states of matter that we don't see so much. And that would be very consistent with these other topics we've been talking about tonight. This is why orbs are seen around crop circles. I know people that have seen these. I just found another one a couple of days ago from one of our tour guests in 2007. I remembered it and I opened the book where she had put the photograph, she had printed it, of something blue and glowing on the ground. And, and it, it, she was sitting there and it just started glowing. And it, it's not a water droplet or anything. You can see it's a really round little blue object that came out of the ground. These often appear around crop circles, too. And um, so it, it shows us that these crop circles are you know, electromagnetically, energetically active in ways you wouldn't expect from something that's inert like wheat. But all the stalks are now facing the same way. You know, the, the, the circle is helical and it has a design to it and a directionality. Right. And... Um, and so that gives it an energy uh, aspect to it that you just normally wouldn't find in stalks that are just standing up that are planted by a seed driller. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, obviously there are people that have come forward over, over the years and there's even, I think, uh, contests where people create crop circles. But there's history of these things going back at least 
a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago, uh, based on on things that I've I've read about, uh, or like the mowing devil from uh, yep. the sixteen hundreds, uh, where people were having their their crops flattened, and yep. these uh, these crop circles that are real, the the apical nodes stretch out and mutate versus snap in half if you're doing it with a uh, rope and a plank or, or something like that. So uh, what do you think is creating these? Is it uh, well, these orbs or? It's, it's more complex than that, Jeffrey. There isn't any doubt that people make them because when we went over there in the late 90s, we didn't think this was possible. But the circle making group contacted us and asked us to watch them as proof first in the daytime and then at nighttime. And I've written about this in my book, Opening Minds, uh, A Journey of Extraordinary Encounters, Crop Circles and Resonances, how I got to realize that some of them were man-made. But the interesting thing was the man-made ones also generate the orbs, the strange electromagnetic effects. We've even recorded these in our own circles that we made where we told people we made them, that it was a test. We would pay the farmer, we would put up a sign. People didn't always believe we had done it, but we did do it. Um, and uh, people can look at these on my YouTube channel. I have a playlist of weird effects around crop circles, cameras, and batteries. If you go to my YouTube channel, just under my name, Simeon Hine or Fractal Friend, um, and you look for that playlist, uh, you'll see all the weird effects we've seen on cameras. And you can see some of the effects uh, even in circles that we made. We made one in Kansas. Uh, we had permission to make a small one in Kansas coming back from the remote viewing conference in Austin, Texas in 2002. And all the photos seem to show a type of ionization, glowing uh, areas on the film that don't look random. They seem to be coming out of certain areas in a, a professional film camera, Nikon camera that was quite expensive and never made mistakes and never did that again. So it seems that there is some sort of effect of the ability of the circle to organize energy. Perhaps it's like an ether dark matter type effect. And of course, that's just speculation on my part. I don't know exactly what does it, but it does it enough that it can. your camera knows what's going on and, and cameras will freeze. They'll act in a strange way. I was just thinking this morning, one of the, and I hadn't thought about this in a while, I had one effect on a camera where it wouldn't focus all of a sudden while in a crop circle. It never did that again and had never done. The, this is in the late 90s when we still used physical cameras with SD cards in them or compact flash at the time. And it still had to focus and it just couldn't find, you know, it's using a little laser or something to focus. I couldn't find anything to focus on. Um, but that type of effect where it could affect multiple devices, even camera crews for BBC, I'm told by other camera crews when I was filming with them, they would give me examples of uh, th their cameras locking up so badly, they had to reboot them and call headquarters for instructions. They'd never experienced this before. You have to restart the camera from scratch. These are professional so-called beta cams in the in the in those days. So I have seen this enough, but these phenomena seem to me related. What you get around cryptids, what you get around UFOs, even remote viewing sometimes, and PK, because these sorts of things happened around Yuri Geller when he was at SRI. Uh, Russell Targus talked about this. It's in the movie uh, Third Eye Spies that I mentioned. So there is a connection between these phenomena in terms of the unexpected electromagnetic effects on cameras, batteries, and equipment, space-time distortions, occasionally things that are called aports, which are physical objects seemingly appearing out of the air, even objects you might have lost a long time ago. You know what they are, but you haven't seen them in a while. Um, it suggests... Rather than being afraid of this and thinking something spooky, I mean, the way I look at it, which you don't have to accept, no one has to accept this, but I see it as a type of space-time malleability that is just different than the type of space-time we've been taught to believe in and that we're ordinarily used to. It's like where it starts to jump around a little bit. And space-time would be malleable. Again, Hal Putoff called it space-time metric engineering. And it wouldn't be surprising, I don't think, if these materials do come from extraterrestrial visitors or visitors from the future or wherever they're from, that someone hasn't figured this out, how to make space-time malleable. 
uh, more like the way it is when we dream so that you can sort of move around in a more fluid way than just a linear way that we do physically. Nothing wrong with that. But that's how I see these topics being connected. You just have the same symptoms. You And this is outlined in dark matter monsters. You have sudden cold. I've talked to witnesses happen around haunted sites. UFOs suddenly becomes cold. Yes. And you also get this cold fusion experiments. There's this rapid absorption. Once you get the coherent matter phase, when it changes again, it can absorb lots of heat in the area to reconstitute itself to ordinary matter. So you get these sudden uh, sudden cold areas. You get this around cryptids. The first thing the witness will say was it started to feel unexpectedly chilly. Yeah. Huh. And then extraordinarily quiet. Even the insects stop singing. Yeah. I doubt yeah. the insects know literally that there's a cryptid around. I think they sent something or the space-time field is changing. And then, and then all these weird effects you can see this, uh, the electromagnetic effects. You can see this on that show, uh, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, which is now, what's it, third or fourth season? Yes. Third season. Yeah. So these sorts of effects are repeated over and over again. I'm just suggesting that it has to do with these type of macroscopic quantum coherent matter effects, something that was talked about in the Lockheed Martin patent for coherent matter waves from the Dutch uh, physicist De Broglie. Uh, De Broglie Bohm uh, effects and so forth, Aronhoff Bohm effects. These are all known in quantum mechanics. They seem to me to be related. And to put it in a nutshell, what we're talking about is unlike ordinary electromagnetic fields where we're used to, where it's linear and it's predictable and it's ordinary, these are more like electromagnetic potentials that are not measured directly but they still have an impact on physical matter. That's what the aronhoff bohm effect is. Uh, Lockheed talks about this extensively in their Lockheed patent. So this is not like quantum woo-woo. I mean, we're talking one physics. I'm suggesting this applies to these topics we call paranormal just because the symptoms seem so similar. Now, it could be something else, but I think this is a good start in a way to look at it, to realize these phenomena are real. People really do experience them. It's not their fault that they have a space-time slip or they lose three or four hours. It would be like if I'm talking to you and all of a sudden I come to awareness in this chair and you're no longer on the screen and it's like six hours have gone by. This is literally what happens to people around these types of phenomena. It's not their fault. That is a fundamental space-time shift that even Einstein would have understood. He did propose a variable speed of light, by the way, I believe in 1907. And again in 1911, but no one really picked up on it. And he was already off doing things that he was awarded a Nobel Prize for. So he didn't really veer much into this direction of variable speed of light. But if you consider that, it seems to go a long way in making sense of these phenomena. I'm not trying to force it. I mean, I'm not trying to, this is, that has to be this way, but I think it's, there's definitely a connection between these and we these phenomena. We know some of the science behind it. So that could be what's going on. And this is why people see orbs and phenomena like this in these types of locations. Wow. That is, yeah, definitely. Uh, the more I've looked into this stuff, it seems like there is there's a connection between all kind of uh, Fortean phenomena. But um, this has been a really fascinating conversation, Simeon. Um, we're just about yeah. at the top of the hour. Can you tell me uh, or tell my listeners where the best place is to find you online, where they can get your books and, and, and all that? Oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Well, people can go to YouTube for my YouTube channel. Just look up my name. Uh, if you'd like to get my books or signed copies, you can go to my blog, which is newcrystalmind.com newcrystalmind.com. I've had that blog going since around 2007. So quite a while. And uh, there's a link at the top to get signed copies of my books for podcast listeners like Strangeology. So go to my, or you can also get them on uh, Amazon. Um, and uh, those would be good places to start. Twitter, I'm on Twitter. I share information on Twitter. That's another place. So. Very good. Thank you for that. And we'll have to do this again sometime, Simeon. This is so much fun. Sure. And uh, we'll catch you all next time.
Thanks again to Dr. Simeon Hine for coming onto the show. He's doing a lot of interesting work, so definitely check out his website and his books. All of his links will be in the show notes for this episode. And as always, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone out there who listens to the Strangeology podcast, people who download it, share it with friends and family, spread the word. It helps me so much when you do that. We're streaming in every corner of the world, which is totally weird and wild. I never thought when I started this podcast a few years back that this many people would be checking out the things that I do and what I have to say and all the topics I research. So thank you again so much for listening and the support. The Strangeology podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. If you're interested in advertising on the Strangeology podcast or would like to collaborate, please send all business inquiries to info at strangeology.com. Again, that's info at strangeology.com. Alternatively, you can head on over to my website, strangeology.com, and go to my contact page and fill out the forms there. This is a call to all listeners. I would love to hear your stories of encounters with cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, the strange and unexplained, the Fortean, the paranormal, all of the above. If you have a story that you'd like to share for the podcast, either in writing or voicemail, or if you'd like to come on to the show, let's get in touch. You can email me at info at strangeology.com or fill out the contact page on my website. I also have a voicemail available that you can call if you prefer to narrate your story that way. The number is 802-448-0612. Again, that's 802-448-0612. I look forward to hearing from you. And if you're looking for another way to support Strangeology, I have a whole merch line on my Etsy shop. You can find it at strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid and alien and Fortean gear available. My designs are on t-shirts, long sleeves, tank tops, hoodies, and sweatshirts since cooler weather is coming. That might be of interest to you. I also have blankets and stickers and magnets, hats, both trucker and dad hats and winter hats as well. There's also prints available, my home state cryptid map, mugs, enamel pins, and so much more. I do all of my own designs and I'm always trying to add in new things as often as I'm able from new designs to different types of merch available. I just added a brand new home state cryptid design for Utah featuring the Bear Lake monster and you can find that along with all of the other states. I have so many of those designs if you like to represent your home state with the most well-known cryptids. It's a real fun time. Anyway, again, that's strangeology.etsy.com. Links will be in the show notes. All right, I think that's all from me for now. I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Simeon was able to hang out for a little bit longer for Strangeology Beyond, the members only portion of the show, to chat about more Fortiana. So you won't want to miss it. Patrons, stick with me. And for everyone else, until the next time, take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange.
All right, welcome back, members, to Strangeology Beyond, your exclusive portion of the show. The conversation today.